Stacy, do you have one of these?
when we are in the laws of the land. I was just listening to Caleb. In fact, I'm going to ask you a question here before we get in, in here. Uh, I was just listening to Caleb this morning. I'm going to get back to the point that I was going flowing with. But, but I want to ask you this question. It has nothing to do with church. It's just kind of a little humorous. It makes you think. So Caleb took a list, or they had a list, of the worst interior. Did anyone listen to Caleb this morning? Mr. King, so maybe you heard this. On Amy and, what's his name, Amy and used to be Franklin Pitts. Keep It's Amy and someone now. But sometimes I'll listen to him in the morning, not too often. I used to take that quiet time with God, but I just wanted to kind of bring myself into worship. So they're asking this question, what is the worst of interior design trends that have ever been. The worst of interior design trends that have ever been. I know this isn't popular so tonight, I'm just asking. Anybody know? I'm making a sit on your up on your seat. She's saying you know what she does. I will agree, I don't care for that 70s trend. That could have been on the list. They didn't share that. Anyone else want to take a, a, a shot? Some of you intended people. Huh? Our sneakers. How about the interior designs of the house? What's something you look back at? You think that was the worst trend ever? What's that? Wood paneling. What's that, Brother Craig? That was on the list. That was at the top. Are you all ready for this? I hope I don't know what they say the worst interior trend was the toilet seat covers and the mat. <laughs> Sorry to have that. It was just on there. <laughs> anyway, I, I found that was very interesting, but all that led up to this. That do you know, and I was on my way to work and got behind someone on 209 driving 40 miles an hour, and I was like one of 15 vehicles on 209, which is unusual at the time of the morning I'm going. But you know, in some, in some states, it's against the law to go too slow. And you can be pulled over for going too slow. So uh, with all that said, you know, we have those who pull the law of the land, we may not like it. Our foot may be a little heavy on the gas pedal, but they're there for us to respect. And let's just bring it on down to the church. The church God has ordained the pastor. This is really hard for me sometimes to say because it's hard to say I'm the one that you need to listen to. But it's not because it's Brother Seville. It's because God ordained that. And so when God establishes church and he gives the, 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 the pastor or the head of the church the, the burden and the place of prayer and, and the place of leading the church, God wants us to obey authority. And then we go down to our council members and our Sunday school leader, uh, the teachers. God places them there to watch over us. That's why Brother Seville doesn't want people that gets out on a whim and a tangent because we want people to love God and is researching the Word of God and doing the best that they can do to teach the Word of God because they are those who come to church. God has placed them there maybe for a lifetime or maybe for a season for them to grow and learn and be able to understand that when you put yourself under the subjection of God's plan that there's blessing there and it's worship to God. You know, even in a household, God has placed the husband as that spiritual leader that's there. And uh, it is a collaboration of working together uh, that as the man is the head of the house and the wife finds herself in that place. We've talked about this before. God, God doesn't want the man to rule over the woman. The woman shouldn't be afraid to say something. And men, you shouldn't be so egotistical that you can't listen to what your wife has to say. But God has placed you, man, as the spiritual head of your house. You need to pray. 
You need to lead in worship. You need to lead in godliness and devotion and see your family grow spiritually. But as the wife finds her place and then the children find their place, God has a place that, and when we respect authority, it's worship to God because ultimately we're respecting God's authority in our life. And so it is worship when we allow our place to be, uh, our lives to be subject in authority. And so in, in, in chapter 13, Paul exhorts us to be subject to authority, especially our minister or pastor. Don't be in debt to anyone. That's a good thing, isn't it? That, 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 that you're not in debt to anyone. I, I've given money to folks before and, and, and not been paid back. It puts me in a bad place. Should I worry about it? No, I shouldn't have. But, but sometimes it can be an uncomfortable place. But we really shouldn't be in debt to anyone. And, 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 and so, uh, 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 but to love each other. Love each other. And he lists some of the Ten Commandments ending with, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. There's something about worship that causes us to be subject to authority. You know, we shouldn't always be pushing the envelope. You ever meet someone that's always pushing the envelope and le leaving life on the edge? I don't, I don't know if that's a godly characteristic. I don't feel it is. But placing yourself under authority. God will bless us because of that. And so someone read Romans 13.10. Love works is no known to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Amen. Love is the fulfilling of the law. This isn't in your notes, but can you turn with me to Proverbs chapter number 4? I don't want to get off on tangent, but I want to share some things that I feel are relevant to us. Proverbs chapter number 4, and... Verse number 23. Someone read that. Yes, if you will. Keep my heart with the fulfillment, for out of it are issues of all. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are issues of life. God says. How many of you can trust your heart? We can. What is it, Sister Tina? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's what the Word of God says. So what we need to do is make sure that our heart, we keep our heart with all diligence, our heart is the foundation of our faith. The, our heart is the seat of our affection, where uh, 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 our affections are. We say, I love you with all my heart. That's our affections. And so when we're talking about sacrificial worship, we need to be keeping our heart. So I, I want to say here that everything about our life should be guided by keeping our heart. And knowing that out of it are the issues of life. And so if, if, if our heart is the foundation of our faith and, and, and Jesus Christ and Him crucified is the foundation of our faith, everything about our heart should be Jesus Christ crucified. And it should be part of our worship. If you were there at the cross, amen, and we've probably been there a thousand, a million times over, where we are there where Christ is crucified, and we don't keep Him on the cross, but we go to the place of, uh, of Calvary. We sung about it tonight. We worship God about it tonight. Going to Calvary, Brother Justin. And as we go there, amen, uh, we worship God. And in our heart, amen, that place to see of our affection, we make sure that we are keeping it. So it affects every area of our life. We're talking about worship. So when we worship God, worship is more than hand raising or more than articulating words out of our mouth. But it is worshiping God with everything that's within us. The Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness, with which, I, which no man shall see the Lord. So in our life, we're keeping our heart. We're being diligent that God makes sure everything in our heart is right, that it affects everything about our life. 
So when we dress, we dress modestly. You know, that's that's why a, a godly person doesn't go out and, and dress provocative or dress in a way that is not pleasing to God or, or reveals parts of their body that should only be kept for that of marriage and intimacy between a man and a woman. There should be nothing that someone does that makes someone else lust or think an evil thought toward them. Because we keep our bodies in such a way that, that it's a sacrifice to God. We worship. And then uh, my wife and I, we were talking today uh, even about that of jewelry and ornamenting ourselves. Why as a believer are we cautious? Because when we look back at, at what jewelry uh, stands for, we look that it really came about by idol worship. Much of it was... about that, that, that it isn't that we worry about the outward adorning of ourself, but we worry about the inward adorning that comes on the outward that reflects godliness in all we do. Even some jewelry can be that of warning off spirits and, 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 and that of, of, of evil things. You've got to be cautious even when folks wear a cross or they wear a Christian relic. There can be a bit of mysticism in that. They think that that, uh, that, that, that trinket uh, uh, keeps evil spirits or, or bad things away. No, our life lived by God in worship and praise gives us the ability to pray and, 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 and bind evil forces. Our prayers through faith, amen, tear down strongholds. And so keeping the issues of our heart, that everything about our life uh, brings worship to God. I believe that even in our life and the way that we conduct ourselves and we keep ourselves, someone can look and see that, hey, they're a Christian. I see by their spirit, by their attitude, by the way they conduct their life, they are a Christian. I believe that that's one of the highest compliments I've ever got before is when someone doesn't know me, but they say, I looked at you and I saw by your life that you're a Christian. You probably experienced it too. And you know what that is? That is a sacrifice of worship to God. It's saying I'm not being conformed to this world, but I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind. And it is a sacrifice of worship to God uh, that, that I live holy. In a world of blending of, of sexes, and uh, I believe that we should love all people. But I'm going to be honest with you tonight. God has made male and God has made female. And, uh, you know, when, when a baby is born, it is not up to them to decide later in life what their gender is. God has already established that. Amen. And so a sacrifice of holy living is living what God has created us and made us to be. You know, even in our clothing, well, we all like to dress nice, probably every one of us. I like dressing nice. I don't, I don't lose out with you if you like to dress nice. In fact, I, you know, some people say, well, I don't, I don't believe, you know, I, I've heard people say, I don't believe Sunday should be all about coming to church and everybody dressed up and showing their big fancy clothes. Well, I don't see it that way. I like to dress up because this is church and I put on my best for God. I don't put it on for you. You know? I'm putting on my best for God. And everybody's best is different. And some people like different things. But we have to make sure that we don't overdo it even in what we look like on the outside. That we haven't kept the heart in sacrificial worship to God. And likewise, for folks that think that they can look like they rolled out of bed and come in their pajamas and never brush their teeth and brush their hair. You know, it might be a sacrifice of worship to take care of the temple that God's given you. So there is a, 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 a balance in that. I just felt like I wanted to say that tonight, that everything about our heart is worship to God and we have to keep it. So our lifestyle is consistent with checking is God honored and God pleased. 
with what I'm doing. And it's every area of our lives. Every area of our life. And it's so hard tonight to try to be completely uh, focused on one area because it's in every area of our life by the way that we spend our time. Because we will be held accountable to the way that we treat our, the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is our body. It's worship to God as we take care of it. Let's move on. So I already, I already, uh, well, in order to love, we have to forgive. We have to forgive. Forgiveness is a sacrifice of worship. Forgiveness is a sacrifice of worship. It is part of being holy and acceptable unto God. Someone read Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness with all which no man shall steal. Once again, back to keeping the statute, the, uh, 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 the, 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 our heart with all diligence, because out of them flows the issues of life. If someone were to be watching your life, they may not come to church, they may not know the Word of God. The only way they're going to see a holy God is through your holy that is on every level, every level, from the distinction of being saved, to being set apart from the world, to living a holy life, to having a holy attitude. People look and see that I see God in heaven because I see the wholeness of God because of the peace of God. We think that without holiness, we won't see God in eternity, and that's true. But no man's going to see the Lord if we don't live holiness on this side of eternity so that God can be reflected <coughs> through us. And that is a sacrifice of worship. And that's something I believe that we're going to continually be working on until the day that we die. So, in order to forgive, we have to give up our feelings and our right to be hurt. In order to forgive, we have to give up our feelings and our right to be hurt. We don't walk our faith by our feelings. If Job was living his faith by the way that he felt, he would have just given up on God. If Joseph would have been walking by his feelings, he would have given up on the dream. If Ruth would have been living alone by her feelings. She would have been angry at God and let her husband die and everything bad happened to her family, but she was faithful to a God that her mother-in-law had. And she would live by her feelings. She worked hard. We can't let our feelings dictate us. Our hearts can be wrong. Our emotions can be wrong. And so we have to overcome our hearts and our emotions with sacrificial worship to God and give up our right to be hurt. I wish I would have learned that a long time ago in a lot of situations before I did. Most of the time, that is the main reason we can't forgive. If I forgive and act like nothing happened, they won't know how much they hurt me. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's not about what God wants. What does God want? God wants us to. It's about giving up our feelings and doing what God wants. And that's really worship. When we can say, you know, I choose God's way. Not my feelings or not my rights. But I choose God. No. I've been thinking about that. You know, look at what Jesus went through. All that he went through. And yet, he said, no, don't forget that. And if Jesus can go through all that and do that, they will forgive what more can we Amen. Amen. That's right, Father Lord. Amen. He said things that we didn't require of us no more than what he did himself. Yeah. Someone read Mark 11.25. So if I 
I can't forgive my neighbor, then God says, I will forgive you. That's pretty steep tonight. We need God's forgiveness. And if we want God's forgiveness exercised in our life, then we have a responsibility to forgive our neighbors. What happens if you choose not to forgive? Someone read Mark 11, 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Neither will, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. We can list many more scriptures about forgiveness. But we all know God requires forgiveness. And we must obey. Does anyone here want to have everything they want to say about forgiveness and how important that's been in your life? We've got to let go and allow God 
amen, surrender to him uh, because our heart, amen, out of our heart, amen, are the issues of life. If there's anything about life, it's the cross. It's the blood of Jesus. It's Jesus crucified and him risen again. And because he said, but Eli, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They can continue to do it, but I forgive them. And they don't understand. They're, uh, they're, 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 they're living by their emotion. Uh, they're holding on to their feelings. And so, but God, I'm not going to do that. Amen. I'm letting go. And I'm allowing you to be glorified in my life. And once again, it's about... What's that? Amen. That's right, brother. Getting it clear. Uh, you know, and he goes on now to say, put away your forward mouth and your perverse lips put far from you. You know what? You don't need to say anything. Be done. Worship God. Amen. Do what God requires. Amen. Live your life in liberty. I've said it a million times over before. Well, what, what does the old saying say? Today I set a... Uh, I forgave someone today. I set a prisoner free, and that prisoner was me. You know, set yourself free. Worship. Allow God the freedom to forgive you and help you. Amen. Amen. We can make excuses for ourselves and says and, and say, God understands my heart. God always understands. But he doesn't always approve. But this is the way I feel. Well, you may feel that way, but just because you feel that way doesn't mean that it's right. Or just because I feel that way. And maybe God doesn't understand how I'm hurt, but it doesn't mean that He approves of my hurt. He wants me to choose life and forgiveness over that. Someone read Proverbs 28 6. 26. Right. That's right. Amen. So what's he saying? Don't trust your heart. It's foolish. But walk in the wisdom of God. Do you think if God's word says that we can trust it? So if he says forgive, we got to forgive. That we can trust him. You know, we we may be hurt. And rightfully so, we may be hurt. But holding on to it will only make it worse for us. So it's foolish not to forgive and trust your heart. It's dangerous to trust. It's dangerous to trust in what we feel. It's dangerous to trust in what we feel. Our feelings change. But the Word of God does not. We may not feel like obeying God. We cannot be half-hearted or double-hearted. It is not enough to have good intentions, but never carry them through. It is not pleasing to God to say, I know what you want. But I'm giving this instead. And I'm going to stop there. I'm going to come back. Let me just make a few comments. That's why it's important to be in the Word of God. Even when we say we don't understand certain things, we continue to read. The more that we read, the Spirit of God will open the eyes of our understanding. The more that we pray, God will help us. How many of you, your feelings about something has changed in your life? You know, you, you change. You know, I, I see the value of sitting down and, and enjoying a little bit of time just talking with family and listening. I'm enjoying listening and women speaking these days. My feelings toward a lot of things have changed in life. It's amazing how parenthood will change you. You know, it's amazing how marriage will change you. That's amazing how age will change you. You with me? Mm-hmm. So, 
We cannot trust our feelings because they change. The way we feel about certain things can change. That's why we need to trust God's word. That's why when God says to do something, you may say, okay, but I'm going to, I'm going to do this instead. And if God says do it, we need to do it. Recently, someone approached my wife and was asking her about some, some things about her life that, that um, uh, she lives and she does. And, and uh, God was dealing with this person about some areas and, and uh, asked her why she does what she does. She shared. The best advice you can say is, if God is dealing with your heart in this area, then you need to do it. Not compromise. It not, needs not to be about what I say, or someone else says, but it needs to be about what God speaks. Now, as a pastor, when I preach the Word of God, you need to be adherent to it. I'm a man. If I, if I miss do something, come to me. Don't play the fight against me all the time. I'm not asking you to do that. But let's talk for a while. Let's see. Let's not go about our feelings. We've got to do what God wants us to do. It needs not to be about us. It needs to be about God. We live in a society where we're trained day in and day out. Put yourself first. Be in touch with your feelings. Well, you can be in touch with your feelings, but if God's word is contrary to your feelings, then you better put your feelings aside and be in touch. doesn't want you to hate. God doesn't want you to hold on to unforgiveness. God doesn't even care if you get the last word. God wants you to do it his way. This heart right here, you need to be diligent in keeping it. It can be this desperate, wicked. You can't trust it. Don't go by those feelings. Keep the cross there. Keep Jesus in control. So that we're pleasing to God. And that is a sacrifice of worship because it isn't easy. Did someone ever do you wrong before? Just blatantly do you wrong because they are being just, just downright mean and vindictive. That's on them. What's on you is to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. God, they don't even know what they're doing. They're talking bad about me. I make you have a sentence that uh, if somebody goes real fast enough and hurts us, they should slow up, you know, just because they, they're trying to uh, be fun with the bump. And, and that is wrong. But I should do that. <laughs> but, but being able to show God to a world, that's the whole of this world. Someone has something they want to say.